Good morning, everybody, or good day, everybody. Thank you for your time and joining us on Wisdom, a six-step process for public contacts. I was gonna go over a little bit about what we do in contacting visitors in the backcountry. And that survey was very, very enlightening. Most of you will be making public contacts this summer, or that's what you do. And as you know, it is truly an art and a science to making public contacts. And so we're gonna go over that today. Obviously, we all do it slightly different. If you're hit the next slide, Jeff. We all do it slightly differently. We're from the different agencies. You might handle rangering and public contact slightly different. Some of you only go out in pairs. Some of you only do public contacts at the trailhead. Others, you might go individually and out for long tours. So we all do it differently. Please check in with your supervisors to find out how you're gonna be doing your contacts in your area. But it's quite common for us to meet people on the trail and do our public contacts, but we need to be doing it in a very professional and efficient way. And that brings us to wisdom. Jack, the next slide. We gotta keep in mind that the Wilderness Act itself this shall be administered for the use and enjoyment of the American people. And truly, people love wilderness areas. They're there for recreation or recreation, connecting with nature, for solitude, for self-reliance. And today, today, no doubt, we're focusing in on recreation. But we all know that wilderness is much more than just recreation, that wilderness transcends recreation. But for today's presentation, we are truly honing in on visitor use and recreation. Jack, next slide, please. So why do people go to wilderness? We do need to keep in mind, they go to wilderness for the same reasons you go to wilderness. They're there to enjoy the back country. They really do not come to wilderness with untoward behavior. They're, they don't come back there with malice to do harm. For the most part, it's just people trying to enjoy the outdoors, enjoy the wilderness. The majority of impact is out of lack of knowledge or skill. And that's where you come in, is as a ranger, you have that opportunity to make it a teachable moment and really help someone understand how they can help take care of wilderness. Jack? So what do you do? I'll never forget many, many years ago when I was a field ranger, I was packing for my 10 day ranger patrol. Back then we did 10 days in, four days out. And I was packing the green rig in the boneyard and my district ranger came out and he saw me loading the 80 pound pack and putting the cross cut in the plasti in the back of the truck. And he actually looked at me and he goes, what do you do back there? What do you do in wilderness? This is my own district ranger asking me, what do you do as a wilderness ranger? Well, I said to him, come with me, come into the back country, I'll show you. Join me on a patrol. Well, he couldn't join me on that patrol, but he actually did come back with me on a, the next patrol that I did. And what he saw is what we do as a backcountry ranger. You know, you're patrolling the wilderness. My jobs involved dismantling fire rings, trail maintenance. In those days, we had wildlife research plots that we watched over. We did weed inventory. And of course, we made the public contacts. And in the areas I patrolled, we had what you might consider higher use. So we not only had speaking with the visitors and the publics, but we also wrote violation notice. We had the Leo side, the law enforcement side of the job where we actually wrote violation notices for people who were not in compliance with the regulations. 
So while I was back there with my ranger, he watched me, he shadowed me and everything that I did. And he was amazed at the job we do in making public contacts. And that evening around this camp stove, as we're cooking dinner, he asked, how did you learn to do what you do? And I said, well, I was just taught by the rangers before me. And he goes, huh? He goes, you know what? When we come out of the woods, I would like you to put the process of making public contacts into some kind of a format where we can use it for training others. So we're just not passing it from the first generation of rangers to the next, but we actually come up with a paper or some kind of a training form that we can teach, help teach other rangers how to make effective public contacts. Jack? In those days in our areas, and it might be true for where you work, our most common violations were for camping, illegal camping, for having campfires or in violation of our campfire regulation. We had issues with very, very large group sizes, so we could have violation notices for group size. We did have issues with dog off leash, and we did have a regulation that dog must be on leash. For others, you might have a, a voice control situation, or maybe you don't even have a dog issue, but back then we really did. And then finally, we dealt a lot with trash, just sloppy, sloppy campers dealing with trash and litter. Jack? So I took my work as a ranger and I actually went back to graduate school and I made this whole concept of visitor contacts and why people violate as my graduate study. I actually surveyed people who received a violation notice in wilderness and I asked them, why did you violate? It was an amazing study. I went to Colorado State University for my master's. And out of that study, I learned a great deal of insight as to why People who go to wilderness violate our wilderness regulations. And here are the top three reasons. So take a look at this, it's very insightful. The very number one reason for violating the wilderness regulations, I didn't think I was hurting anything. And implied in that statement is that people probably knew they were doing wrong, but what they were doing, they did not see their action as really hurting anything. That's extremely insightful for the work you do as a wilderness ranger. The second one, the topography of the land made it impossible to comply. Now this came up mostly with camping violations. And in those days you had to be back a hundred feet or more from lake stream or trails. So in their mind, in their skill levels, going back further than 100 feet left them with no flat land to set up a camp or a tent. So in their mind, the landscape, the geology, the topography made it impossible for those to comply. Again, that's very insightful to your job as a wilderness ranger you can help them in finding a level or an appropriate camp spot. And the third one, I was unaware of the regulation. Now, all of you know that involved in this one is some psychology and sociology of deflecting the blame or fault that they didn't want to admit that they violated. So uh, many would say I was unaware of the regulation. However, in my study, it was set up where I could ask additional questions to dig a little deeper here. And sure enough, there's situations where people are very spontaneous about their trip to wilderness. They might come late in the afternoon. They might throw on their pack and just bust right up the trail without ever looking at the trailhead signs 
are reading about the regulations. So there are truly some people who you will find in the back country that literally are unaware of the regulation. Once again, this is your chance to not only tell them about the regulation, but explain the regulation. Jack? So here is the six step process that I developed. It's called wisdom, and we're gonna go through all six steps, but essentially it's W-I-S-D-O-M. The W is where are you coming from? Secondly, to professionally introduce yourself. Third is size up the situation. Fourth, you decide on a course of action. The O is to outline or explain, explain the regulation. And then finally, to make a positive impression. Those are the six systematic steps for making effective, efficient, and professional public contacts in the backcountry. Jack? So let's go over, I'm starting with the, where are you coming from? This one is thinking about where you are mentally and are you prepared for your job as a backcountry ranger when you walk in to the backcountry? Are you hiking? Are you prepared to make your first public contact on your patrol? You see a lot of times, you need to just forget what happened last night, forget about the morning rush to get the vehicle ready and doing the tailgate safety session and all that you had to do just to get ready to get to the trailhead. You need to filter out all of that and get yourself mentally prepared to make public contacts. Our visitors deserve the best of us and you need to be ready to be professional and present yourself in a professional way and to be focused, focused on our visitors. Jack? So you introduce yourself. You need to professionally introduce yourself. You will probably be in uniform. I hope you are in uniform and you're properly identified. The badge is over the heart. The name tag is on the other side. If you're out there for long patrols, you do your best to stay clean and well-groomed, but you're a backcountry ranger and you just do your very best. When you introduce yourself, it's best if you state your name and your wilderness area. So it would go like some, hello, my name is Ralph Swain. I'm a wilderness ranger here in the Bob Marshall wilderness. It would be nice if you also mentioned the name of the forest, so you have your complete jurisdiction in your introduction, but sometimes that can get quite long. And part of this introduction is where you meet the visitor and the body language that they give off. Sometimes when you're in uniform and they see a ranger, people can actually feel threatened, feel threatened by seeing a ranger in uniform. So you got to be very good at picking up on body language. Be very aware of your spacing, the distance between you and the visitor. If you meet them on the trail, you can say hello from a distance. And then as you come a little closer, hello, my name is Ralph Swain. I'm a wilderness ranger here in, yeah, scapegoat wilderness. So be aware of your spacing. Be aware of the visitor's body language and just be aware of their timing. Sometimes you can tell they're in a hurry and you don't have much time. Other times they are so happy. They're so pleased to see a ranger and they have questions for you. And if anything, they're going to hold you in place when you know you need to get up the trail. So just be very aware. This is a time when we actually ask that you take off your sunglasses. Bring your sunglass strap, be ready to pull your glasses down off your eyes and make eye contact with your visitors. I'm gonna to suggest that to you that you do not start your contact 
with your glasses on. Now we're gonna talk later about situations that might become confrontational. And that's where you actually might raise your glasses up and put them on. Next slide, Jeff. So you size up the situation and I already know what you're thinking here. All of you get so good at this that you know you're actually sizing up the situation way before you introduce yourself. That you're, be, you're so good at picking up on the clues that long before you say your name and introduce yourself, you're already noticing that there is a dog off leash or that they're in a backpack and not a day pack. So you understand that they're day hiking. So you size up the situation and actually wisdom could have been WS, size up the situation, then introduced, but you wouldn't have wisdom if you would have done that. So it's WIS, you introduce yourself and then you size up the situation. But we all know that's what you're doing. Sometimes you might have a partner with you. It might be that you're a ranger with a volunteer or there's two rangers. So you really use the buddy system here and you have your partner be your second set of eyes and really looking around, especially if you're coming into a camp location where you already have discussed with your partner that I'll be making the introduction and talking to the people you're off to the side to my right and you're sizing up the situation and you're my second side of eyes just in case something ever goes wrong. Jack? Then you decide on a course of action. In many, many cases, the action we'll be taking here is nothing more than educational. We're going to inform the visitors and we're going to inspire them we're gonna provoke them to actually get engaged, to be involved in taking care of the wilderness. But there are cases, and many of you are involved in actually writing violations or warnings. If the situation warrants that type of action, a violation notice, then you have to be prepared and act accordingly. So you have to quickly decide on your course of action. Is it educational or is it something else? And then finally, you need to capitalize on the teachable moment. Sometimes you will see that people are camped in a location where you can explain why that is a very fragile area and where they might wanna move their camp to another place that is a more hardened surface that can take the impact of a group camping. So this is that teachable moment where you can really inform them and educate them to leave no trace and outdoor skills. Next. To outline and explain the regulation. This goes back to my master's study and it's so important that to not only inform them of the regulation, whether it's camping, campfire, whatever your situation is, but explain why. Why is there a regulation? And this is where authority of the resource can really come in handy. Authority of the resource was developed by Dr. George Wallace, who is from Colorado State University. We actually went to graduate school together Jack is a, George is a dear, dear friend. And he came up with authority of the resource, which Jack is gonna go over in the role plays during today's exercise. But the whole idea of authority of the resource is you, instead of saying these are the regulation and these are the rules and you're in the uniform and you have this authority, you actually shift and you turn the attention to the resource and you speak of why the resource is the most important thing. And instead of going with the authority of the badge of the uniform, it's the authority of the resource. You draw attention to the resource and not 
to the regulation. And then finally, the last one here, you make a positive impression. And I know you can do it, folks. I was a backcountry ranger for many years and I actually had to write violation notices. And at the end of writing a ticket, I would have visitors thank me, thank me for writing them a ticket. You need to conduct yourself through the six steps in a very professional manner, be prepared, be concise, and leave your visitor with a positive impression of why it is important to protect the wilderness resource. Next slide, Jeff. So a few tips as we conclude here. There are some tips for your own personal safety. One thing is if you do carry a radio that you can turn up the squelch on your radio, usually you have this strapped, either shoulder strapped or a waist strap. You can turn up your squelch and you can actually get a, a ping off of your radio and that would let the visitor know that you're not alone, that you have radio contact and you can call out if you need to. So make your radio visible and turn up the squelch. When you're talking to the visitors, you always say we instead of I, that we will be patrolling the area, not I will be patrolling the area. Make it sound like you're with another ranger, even in the cases where you might not be. Use we. You never give away the location of your camp location. There are times when visitors will be very, very friendly and say, well, come back after you do your camp patrol, whatever, come back and have coffee with us and all of that. Well, I will leave that up to your discretion of whether you meet up with visitors later, but you never, you never give away your location of where you are camped. Be very, very careful and watch out for your own safety in the backcountry. And then when you're making contacts, whether you're on your own or with a partner, you know as you enter that camping location, you have already scouted out the escape route because you never know when a presentation or a patrol contact might actually go south. Something might go wrong. Something might actually become very confrontational and you have no choice but to put palms up and start backing out. And when you back out, you need your escape route. So we as backcountry rangers get very good about this. When you're coming into, let's say a tent camping location, you know that you do not have your back to a tree, that you have an opening and you have your escape route. There are other hints or tips that we can offer you, but these are ones you should keep in mind at all times. Be safe as you do your job, be professional as you do your job. And Jack, if you're switched to the next slide, go with wisdom, go with wisdom. I'm convinced if you're used the six step process as well as art, which are the exercises we're about to do, the role play, that you can make professional contacts in the back country. You can keep yourself safe, and you can engage our visitors in helping to take care of their wilderness. I wanna thank you for your time and Jack, I'll turn it back over to you for the chat and questions. All right, great. Well, let's go ahead and save the questions uh, for the end. All right, so my name is Jack Ader. I'm a wilderness ranger for the Bitterroot National Forest. And today I'm gonna to be talking to you about the authority of the resource. You all have probably heard about the authority of the resource at some point in your careers. Um, and Ralph just told us about it. So of course, uh, it was written by Dr. George Wallace from Colorado State University. And it's a really great article. And you know, we define authority by, uh, it's the power to influence or command thought, opinion, or behavior. But wild nature can, said to, can, can be said to have its own authority. 
So desired behavior is more likely to occur if people understand how their actions affect the way nature operates. Too often we use the authority of the agency where we rely on laws, regulations, on badges and the ranger's presence to persuade a visitor rather than what we're trying to discuss, which is focusing on the natural authority, which is inherent in the requirements of a healthy ecosystem. We gotta remember that people are out for recreation and they need restful intellectual visions, not dull facts, rules, and manuals. So in the article, he outlines three steps to the authority of the resource technique. The first one is to give an objective description of the situation because it's hard to say who the perpetrator was. And by doing this, it helps avoid implications. So instead of saying, you know, I see your dog doing this, you say, oh, I noticed that there was a dog here earlier. The second step, explain the implications of the action or the situation that was observed. And this is where you attempt to reveal the authority of that resource, but you also want to include the social impacts. So what the undesirable behavior that they, might have, they may have uh, engaged in also has social impacts. So this is where you explain to them, uh, you know, how it affects the environment. And then you go on and you say, you tell them how, you tell them how you feel it, how you feel and what can and should be done to improve the situation. And we wanna use I messages, I feel this, or we feel this way. And people assume that if you feel that way, that's how the agency feels as well, or the public as a whole. And then we just expand the three steps from the article into a, a more, um, a little bit longer five techniques of the authority of the resource technique. So like I said, you know, you wanna give the person the benefit of the doubt, because it could be somebody else that caused the impact. You wanna show consideration and tact, build rapport with the person you're approaching. You know, they, you don't know, but they may be new to traveling and camping in the outdoors. and They probably don't have the experience that you have minimizing their impacts. And we wanna stand side by side with the people that we interact with. Uh, it's, there's a lot of tension that is uh, developed when you confront someone eye to eye. So you wanna stand off to the side, so that the problem that you're discussing is in front of you or the lake is out there you're talking about or the beautiful view out there or you know the dog or whatever and remember this is an opportunity to educate and so you want to be able to teach people the reasons why and how their impacts affect this wilderness resource and then last try to give them an alternative so instead of just telling them you know how their actions have affected the wilderness give them an opportunity to try something else or do something different. So instead of taking the antler shed out, maybe just take a picture. So this is the uh, portion of the class where we're gonna uh, experiment with bringing other people in and we're gonna practice some scenarios. I've asked uh, three really great uh, wilderness folks to come on and join me as we act out some scenarios. So with that, we're gonna start with the first scenario. And of course, uh, Conrad is gonna be uh, my first ranger. And as I'm reading the, the scenario, I'll have Conrad come on and uh, turn his camera on, be ready to speak. But here's the situation. So I just moved into a neighborhood that abuts the national forest land. Spring has arrived and I decided to go for a mountain bike ride near my house. I ride for about 30 minutes and then I notice a sign that says rattlesnake wilderness. And I'm, I'm going too fast to notice what it, said, what it says underneath. And I don't know what wilderness is, but I think, wow, this is such a cool trip. And then I notice Conrad walking towards me. So Conrad is a wilderness ranger in the rattlesnake. And incidentally, he actually is the wilderness ranger in the rattlesnake wilderness. And he spent the day checking on work that's being done on a dam in the wilderness. And he's headed out and down the trail and he sees me biking towards him. And we're about two miles from the wilderness boundary and we approach, he approaches me. So with that, we'll say, all right, Conrad, action. I got my bike. All right. All right. Yep. Um, hey there. Hey man, how's it going? Hey, would you mind uh, stopping for a second? I'm, I'm Conrad Schott, I'm the uh, wilderness ranger here in the Rattlesnake. Oh, how's it going, man? Dude, what a sick ride, bro. It's awesome out here. Well, you're out for, you're out for a bike ride, huh? Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you know much about uh, the wilderness here that we're in, the rattlesnake? Wilderness? I don't know anything about wilderness. What are you talking about? 
Oh, okay. So, yeah, I've actually got a map here. Check it out. You're in the rattlesnake wilderness. Um, oh, neat. The map. But anyways, um, so wilderness is pretty cool because it's, um, you know, it's kind of this designation where, you know, you're talking about what a cool ride it is. It's a kind of protected class of land, but part of that is, you know, there's some special rules we all have to follow out here. Uh, and one of those is, is no mechanized transport. Um, and we're just trying to get people to, you know, slow down and uh, enjoy nature and give nature the chance to, to kind of take a break from the modern world. So uh, I noticed mm. you're on your mountain bike here. Yeah, great ride, great trail. You see the, the no mountain biking sign there back at the boundary? No, I didn't see it. I, I was hauling. Okay, well, um, man, I, it's too bad. Um, I really hate to interrupt your ride, but you think you might be able to, to turn back and, and head back towards uh, the National Recreation Area on the other side? There's actually tons of really good mountain biking that, that direction. Yeah, yeah, I guess. I just, I, yeah, I guess so. Well, no mechanized uh, transport. Okay. All right. So sure. I can use a wheelbarrow when I'm out here. And that's just, you know, we're trying to, to kind of keep things in a sort of traditional, like more primitive use of tools and equipment like that. And that way there's not so many folks out here too. Huh. Yeah, I never heard of that. That sounds cool. Maybe, uh, yeah, I'll walk out with you. Maybe you can tell me some more about the wilderness. All right, yeah, let's, let's head back up the trail here. Cool. All right, end scene. Thanks, Conrad. Good. So Conrad uh, used the authority of the resource. He gave me an alternative, something to do. Walk out with me. We can have a chat. He explained, uh, you know, why we don't let mechanized uh, transport in the wilderness. Good. Um, thank you, Conrad. Ralph, do you want to say anything at this point? No, keep going. Okay. Oh, uh, all right. So next time, so here we go. So I'll have Echo stand by. So here's the next scenario. So myself and my friends are on a, uh, the last day of a 10 day backpacking trip in the Bridger wilderness. We're headed to the trailhead, but we still have a six hour drive before we get home. Feeling rushed, we begin to take shortcuts down the trail. We know that, I know that it's not the trail that we're on, but it seems to be cutting a lot of time off my travel. And I look up and then I see Echo coming towards me. And so Echo, she is a wilderness ranger and she's on the first day of a 10 day hitch into the Bridger Wilderness. And she's anxious to get to her campsite for the night. And um, she looks up and she sees me uh, hiking down the trail and cutting the switchbacks. And so she decides to talk, stop and talk with me about it. So, Echo, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. All right, good. So, <laughs> yeah. All right, good. So uh, when you're ready, uh, action. Yeah, great. Uh, hey, folks. Hey, do you have a minute to stop and chat real quick? Yeah. Oh, hey, how's it going? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. How are you? Hey, good. I'm doing great. Uh, my name's Echo. I'm the wilderness ranger out here in the Bridger Wilderness uh, with the Forest Service. Yeah, it looks like, what, are you guys coming off a, a trip out here? You look like you're in a little bit of a rush. Yeah, we're in a rush. We got six hours to go. We just we just got done with this really awesome trip uh, back there in the wilderness. But yeah, getting late and man, we're just trying to get out of here so we don't have to drive in the dark, you know? Yeah, no, that's totally understandable. I'm anxious to get up to my first campsite for the night too, trying to you'd walk up there. Um, yeah, I noticed, I saw, I heard some bushwhacking and uh, saw some people just kind of charging down the hill. Um, I don't know if you guys, if that was you, and if you noticed that you weren't hiking on the actual trail at all anymore. Oh, uh, yeah, that was us. We just, uh, I saw that trail, you know, that other trail. I know it's not the main trail, but saw it and it was like, oh, this would be a great way to cut some time. <laughs> and we, you know, we saw that it was already kind of a trail. So we just, you know, took it. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. It's definitely nice to get down quicker. Uh, but I, one thing that uh, we like to tell people and just remind people of is staying on the trail when we're traveling. Um, those switchbacks can make it really convenient or those switchback cutoffs can make it really convenient to you know, get down the mountain quicker, but there are a lot of uh, native plant species and um, some of them like endangered or they aren't found anywhere else but here. And um, sometimes they can look a lot like just a regular plant, but you don't notice those. Um, and so when you go 
hiking off trail and start cutting switchbacks and stuff, it's really easy to damage uh, that plant's environment or damage a plant without even knowing um, that you did it. And so it can be a total accident. And so I really like to ask people to stay on trail, even if it adds a couple minutes to your hike back down, just so then we can preserve those plants and that environment for, you know, the next time you want to come back out here, or maybe, you know, your friends or super in the future, your grandchildren and other people. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. And I probably knew that, but man, we're just in a rush. So, you know, thanks for reminding me. We'll, we'll, we'll just get back on the regular trail. All right. Okay. Thank you. Nice Thank to you. see you. Yeah, All right, let's go guys. We've got to go. All right. Safe, cool. safe travel. Scene. Awesome. Cool. Thank you, Echo. Good job. Uh, nice rapport building. Um, and I like uh, that you explained what I was doing and why it affects the resource. So good job at the authority of the resource. Thank you for participating. All right. Oh, I forgot. All right. I'm going to put this up next time for Khalil so you guys can look through that. So here's the next scenario. My friend Khalil is going to come on and we're gonna do this one as I'm reading. So I'm with a group of friends and I'm camped in the Bob Marshall Wilderness Complex and we're all taking turns doing the dishes. And it's been a long day and it's now it's my turn to wash the dishes. So I grab the soap, stack of dishes and head for the lake. And I noticed that there's food particles drifting off into the lake as well as some soap and water. And I'm thinking, I wonder if this is the best thing to be doing. And just as I wonder this, up walks Khalil. And so, Khalil is a wilderness ranger in the Bob Marshall Wilderness. He's just set up his camp and he decides to hike around the lake on the evening patrol. And after a few minutes, he comes upon me washing dishes in the lake. And he can see the food particles and the soap drifting away into the lake. And so he stops to speak with me. So Khalil, action. Hey there, how's it going? Oh, hey man, how are you doing? What a, wow, what a nice night, huh? Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, my name's Khalil. I'm a wilderness ranger with the, uh, here in the Bob Marshall Wilderness. Um, yeah, beautiful night, awesome campsite you guys got. How's your evening yeah. going? Oh man, it's great, tired, it was a good day today. Yeah, the group, they told me go wash the dishes. So here I got the, the job of doing the dishes. Yeah, it's your turn tonight, right on. Yeah, um, but yeah I couldn't help but notice you were washing your dishes right in the lake. Um, yeah, I was thinking, I was wondering about that too. Like, uh, you can see the food out there. Yeah, I thought maybe solution to pollution is delusion or something, huh? Yeah, um, we're actually encouraging people to try to wash their dishes not directly in the lake. Um, yeah, it can. It puts a when you wash your food particles, and especially when you're using a soap like that, it puts an unnatural amount of nutrients in the lake and can really degrade the water quality and affect the trout in the lake and other wildlife that use the lake, the what, just the water quality and the clarity and appeal of the lake in general. Um, so what you can do is if you walk up the hill uh, as close to 200 feet as you can and bring some water in your pot up there and wash your dishes up there, um, the soil will naturally filter out those food particles in the soap you're using and it can really uh, keep this lake pristine. Um, yeah, for your kids and my kids and just make it that's what, what makes this lake so awesome, right? Is that it's pristine up here and it's beautiful, right? We want to keep it that way. I, I hear you. Hey, thanks for telling me that. I'm going to go tell those guys. They don't know what the hell they're doing. I'm going to go remind them. Thanks for I telling me. I appreciate you educating your friends and making an effort to keep this place pristine and natural. Yeah. Oh, well, it's a great a spot. Good well, thanks. All right, cool. End scene. Excellent, Khalil. Thanks for, for participating. Uh, I like as well that you were able to give me an alternative and explain to me, you know, how my actions are affecting the lake. And uh, so very good. Thanks for participating. Thanks to everybody for participating. So there you go. This is a quick little fun uh, couple of scenarios to practice the authority of the resource. I'm sure plenty of you have done this before, but if not, there's a little review of it. So with that, that's the end of my presentation. Um, I believe we have some additional resources in the, in the chat box. Um, uh, we are time for questions and Ralph, I'm sure you have some more stuff you'd like to say to wrap it up. 
Hey, Jack, if, if I can, this is Jimmy. Um, I'm gonna ask Dan if he'll spotlight me as well. Just wanna give a big thanks to Echo, Conrad and Khalil for doing that, right? Um, it's our first time trying to do this in a virtual environment. And, um, and so it, it worked pretty well. Um, when we would typically do this in the field, boy, we might spend um, a few hours going through these scenarios and giving each other um, feedback and critiques and, and really just kind of building that flow of a discussion that you would have in the field. I think most of us have found that even if you have the gift of gab, um, getting into a conversation with someone where you're asking them to to do something um, other than what they're doing on their vacation or their trip uh, can be awkward. And having these tools in your toolbox as a way to, um, to, to have those discussions is extremely helpful. And so um, I, just round of applause. I tried using the reaction applause, but it didn't really work for me. Um, round of applause for everyone for, for taking this on today and doing the scenarios. and. Um, and we do have time for Q&A, but as Jack said, I do wanna make sure that you're aware of um, all of the resources that have been referenced uh, by Ralph and Jack are in the chat box. You can download them for future use. There's a chart with a list of scenarios that you can use to, to create your own um, public contact trainings uh, on your unit or with your staff or folks. In, um, so I'd say um, use that stuff. Um, and with that, um, I do want, we do have some questions and I'm gonna ask folks in the audience if you, you have questions just to put them in the chat box, but um, we'll loop back. Sorry, Ralph, uh, any other thoughts from you two before we jump into some Q and A's and kind of see where this goes? No, from my side, Jimmy, thanks for mentioning the resources. I apologize, but on, on the wisdom side, I do have as one of the resources, the outline or the flyer that goes through the six steps, W-I-S-B-O-M. And then I prepared a process paper that gives you a little more detail about each one of the steps and then a little more on ranger safety. I would like to mention, and Jimmy, I think it's going to come up in the chat, wisdom specifically, the wisdom training is not meant to take the place of law enforcement training. And for, uh, for the Forest Service people, that would be the, force, the uh, Forest Protection Officer FPO training. So this is not meant to be law enforcement. As I mentioned, over 90% of your contacts in the backcountry will mostly be on the educational side of a contact. It's, this is wisdom is not really meant to take the place of, of uh, the verto, uh, verbal judo, verbal judo or FBO training. It's meant to set up a situation where you think through a process of how you're going to conduct yourself in talking with visitors. And that will come up, I think, in the chats there, Jim. Great, yeah, Ralph, someone did bring up verbal judo. And um, I'll be honest, I looked for a resource paper for that, for this, this training and found a number of videos that were very law enforcement oriented, but it is something I think um, folks should become aware of, even if, if you're doing law enforcement or not, as a way to think about making public contacts. Um, I'll throw out the first question for you, and, and it's from um, Avery, and it says, why is it that rangers can't open carry? Seems unsafe for the official stance to be put, uh, put your hands up and hop for the hope for the best. Any thoughts on that from either of you? So I take it this is carrying a gun as a law enforcement person. So each yes, agency so. does this differently, but for Park Service and I'm pretty sure, uh, well, definitely Forest Service, you have to go to special training before you can pack or carry a weapon. And so, and that is a very extensive training. 
Therefore, most of our backcountry rangers do not, do not and do not have the authority to pack a weapon or carry a weapon into the backcountry unless they've had that advanced training. Yes, absolutely correct. There are situations that could be threatening and we have to be very, very careful. That's why we do size up the situation before we walk in to the contact, size it up, be aware of what you're getting into. And then if it doesn't look right, you don't try to make some kind of formal closure. You really just back out. That's why it's so incredible, so incredibly important that you have your radio, your radio squelches up and you can make contact as soon as you can to dispatch and let them know of your situation. Again, 99% of the time, people are back there to enjoy the wilderness and things are not threatening or confrontational, but you have to be ready for that. Jack, if you wanna to add to that. Great, well, um, we have a comment from Celia, um, and it may actually connect to the next one. She says, uh, several of us PWV, I believe is Poodle Wilderness Volunteers, uh, volunteers were talking recently about how the authority of the resource isn't as compelling to visitors as the personal consequences of their action. Loose dog on a trail contaminates scent of corridor and hassles animals, but what speaks to the visitor is a poison ivy covered dog is in the back seat with your toddler isn't a good idea. Any yeah. thoughts on that? Go ahead, Jack. That's great. If you can go, if you can portray that message to somebody, yeah, that sounds very effective. Nice comment. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll follow up on that. So good to hear from PWB. Hi, you folks out there. Yes, actually, if you think about that, for every one of the situations. You're trying to find a way to alter or change the behavior that someone's currently doing and think of doing it another way. And the best way to do that is to find an incentive, something that is really positive for them to change their behavior. That part about the dog, that is outstanding. Another one is camping in their camping location. You can explain to them that getting away from the water and the fragile ecosystem of the riparian zone and moving their camp up, up higher, maybe on a bench far away from water, that there will be less mosquitoes and you will enjoy your camping better up there than down here. So along that same line for every situation, try to think of something very positive and an incentive for them to comply or to change their behavior. And in almost every case, you can find something just like that, poison ivy and the dog, where it's to their advantage to control their animal, to have their dog on leash. Good job. Thanks, great, great responses. Um, Michelle Gilbert, is there research on the effectiveness of uh, the authority of the resource technique? Um, uh, I feel like that was a cue for, for me to share um, a research project I did um, over 20 years ago that did look at the effectiveness of the authority of resource technique in a, a variety of different scenarios and um, situations. And I think common sense for, for most of us is where my thesis project landed is that there are certain visitors and probably where they're coming from with their behavior um, where the authority the resource technique is going to be useful for those who do indeed um, not know what they're doing is wrong or perhaps aren't familiar with the regulations or the why. Um, we have a stronger chance at changing their behavior than the person who is fully aware of um, the rule or regulation and chooses for whatever reason um, to, to not um, follow it. And uh, I guess I would put in a plug for uh, research that's 20 years old. Um, I don't know, we have a new new set of visitors now. And I would say it would be interesting to, to take that research and, and update it 
Um, it was published in the Journal of Interpretation. I, I um, if I can find the article on my hard drive, I'll drop it in here. Um, but uh, yeah, um, that is the response for that. There, there has been some research, but that's that's it as far as I know. Not much more beyond that. Jack and Ralph, maybe you have something to add to that. Okay, we do have quite a few questions popping up, so I'm going to work my way through them. Um, and we can keep going here. Um, what would you advise is the best way to deal with negative reactions from public visitors when using the authority of the resource? Ralph, Jack? Just, uh, I, do your best to uh, help them understand you know, what they're doing may impair the resource. Be tactful, you know, what the authority of the resource article says at the end is that when what we've also been saying is that in some cases uh, it doesn't work and you might have to use the authority of the agency, right? And cite them for a violation. Um, I don't know, at some point you, you wanna be as tactful and as positive as, and as you can, but that's, Ralph, you wanna take it from there? No, you're, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. The authority of the resource will only go so far. And there are situations where a violation is a violation is a violation or needing to explain and follow up on the regulation is the course of action. I mean, that first scenario about the mountain bike, now we all might do this differently. So you gotta talk to your unit and your supervisors, but mountain bikes are prohibited in wilderness by law. Therefore in deciding a course of action on that one, I personally, a mountain bike in wilderness is an automatic violation notice. I would not walk away or turn from that one. It is a violation. So there are times and it's appropriate to stay on the regulation side of this. There are other times when it's truly, truly a teachable moment. You can stand side by side, look at the resource, speak to the resource and get more, more for your time with that visitor and helping them to understand by going with the authority of the resource, but not always. Great. Um, so I had a request to repost the resources, and so they should be in the chat box again for those who might have joined late and I think can't get to the earlier chat. Um, Vic Victoria, um, I want to read your uh, question, but I, I do think it ties into some of our existing discussion. Hello, I love the authority of the resource technique. I share it with my colleagues. I am a white CIS and female, and I wonder if anyone has run it by more visually diverse, varied audiences or colleagues and gotten any feedback on if it has any blind spots regarding diverse audiences. The only thing I can think is that I am LGBT. And so if the reason to not step on an alpine plant is because all plants need a mommy and daddy, I would be a little annoyed myself, uh, both for myself and for for single parents as it could be said to be less exclusive. It's a great point. Um, I mean, I've had a, a dialogue with someone who, who thinks that for some people, uh, the agency authority might not speak as well as um, a peer-to-peer -peer contact, right? Um, a visitor or a volunteer, so to speak, may, may sometimes uh, resonate better with a visitor than, than even the agency person. And so any thoughts on that from you, Jack or Ralph? Yeah, I mean, it's, it goes for anything as a representative of whatever organization you are, you gotta be tactful and sensitive. And I guess everything you do, you gotta be aware of uh, who your audience is and how to uh, best or most effectively communicate to them without offense. Um, it's tricky. That's why, uh, it, you know, that's why you're out there is because clearly someone thinks that you can do it well and um, or you're learning to do it well and getting that message across.
I have a question from uh, Balin, and it says, in regards with the switchback situation, what do you do if the visitor said they don't want to go off, they didn't go off trail? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Ah, that's tricky too. You, then you might have to um, use a little bit more of the authority of the agency and say, well, I did see you go off the trail and uh, I'm going to cite you for the violation, you know? And we learn in uh, force protection officer school, right? That if people become too, you know, aggressive or hostile, then you simply say, all right, uh, you didn't go off trail. All right, have a good day. You just let it go, you walk away. I mean, there's only so much you can do, especially if you're not a commissioned officer, right? So do the best you can. I think you've got an opportunity Great. for them to um, pretend a little bit. They're pretending they didn't go off. You can pretend that maybe somebody else went off, but you can still explain the situation and get the message across. Yes, good point. Looking for more questions. Um, I did see, um, so I think on the third try, all the materials should be back in the chat box um, and everyone should be able to see them. Any other questions or feedback or dialogue regarding the scenarios or? Ralph's presentation on wisdom, Ralph. Yeah, I just wanted to conclude with, folks, do not sell yourself short. You come to the back country with this amazing amount of skills that the visitors don't always have. I mean, you know the plants, you know the land, you know the country, you have so much credibility and offering what you do as a public contact to our visitors. So whenever you can, and there's a chance to speak to the interpretive side of your work, like uh, identifying a nearby plant or tree or some species, or speaking to the hike and mentioning about an upcoming something ahead that there are three switchbacks and after that you'll find a waterfall. Don't forget to take a look at the waterfall or just remember folks that you have so much to offer these visitors. And again, in my opinion and working in the back country, the majority of the contacts I've had, they've number one been surprised, surprised to see a ranger in the back country because we have such limited field presence, but not only surprised, they're very anxious to draw your, your skills, your information and ask you questions. So take advantage of that. You know, you, you come with so much credibility and you can impart so much wisdom, so much wisdom that do not undersell yourself. You are a professional backcountry ranger and you have the chance to really make a difference in someone's life. So I do have another question in, in here. It says, um, does a log exist in any of the agencies of these contacts with the public? So do we keep track of these contacts? So Jim, Jimmy, if you don't mind, I'll start with that. It's not law, it's policy. In our policies, especially for the Forest Service, we hey, did Ralph, in fact- I'm sorry, uh, it's log, L-O-G. Oh, log. Like log. Oh, I apologize, I heard it as law. So uh, for our backcountry rangers and the Forest Service, we did actually keep a log and we have some log templates that were used in the past of how many contacts, what were the major violations or what were your major things that you had to deal with? So, Jimmy, are you aware of any of those logs, those recording kind of paperwork that we might still have around? I think um, 
many units use uh, the rangers use forms to document how many contacts they have and then what types of contacts but i do think it varies i also think there there are samples of those ranger reports so to speak um, on wilderness connect that you can see examples of but there's no um, repository centralized that i know of where we put those and track you know where where are we going and and i would offer that that's the importance of having consistent field presences not only to be able to document those things but to have the um professional out there to tell the story of what's going on and and note the changes in visitor behavior or where we're spending most of our time in addition to documenting it i think is always uh helpful DWV has developed uh, software that's used by Canyon Lakes Ranger District, so our volunteers track that kind of information. Uh, number of visitors seen, number of visitors contacted, what they're doing, whether they're fishermen or day hikers or backpackers, uh, lists of violations, uh, number of fire rings dismantled, all that kind of stuff, and um, that software is available if anybody else wants to use it. It's, um, it's, it's not necessarily public domain in that sense, but it's, um, we're, we're more than glad to share it. And is that through PWV, Poudre Wilderness Volunteers? Yes, it is. Okay. And if you contact me, I can give you the, the, the people to talk to about that. Great, thank you. So I guess I'd like to throw another um, couple of connections into the, the discussion and, um, it connects to probably the uh, one of the other tracks, the Wilderness One or Wilderness Two. They're talking about wilderness stewardship performance, and uh, every wilderness should have a wilderness education plan. And a part of that education plan uh, can be an emphasis on having people in the field to make public contacts or your messaging that you have at trailheads, and and using this principle of the authority the resource technique. Um, for me, with that messaging is also something you can do at trailheads. You know, people want to know the whys behind uh, the reasons we're asking them to do things. And so um, I would encourage you to, if you don't know about your wilderness education plan, to ask the staff from the agency that you work for about it. Uh, I don't know about the other agencies, but the Forest Service should have one for each wilderness and uh, see where what you're doing connects to that education plan. And if it needs to be updated or changed, um, maybe now is the time to think about that as well. So um, here, here's a question that says, are drones allowed in the back country for monitoring purposes? Jack, well, you'll take that one? Yeah. No. <laughs> I mean, the way I understand it, the uh, Forest Service wilderness areas, you are not allowed to fly a drone in wilderness. So, but yeah, wouldn't that be a great way to monitor people's behavior uh, with drones? I don't, I, was that a joke question or is that real? <laughs> Someone's laughing. Uh, no, we're not, we know, no, drones are not allowed. We don't fly drones for monitoring purposes in wilderness. But I could see it for outside of wilderness, possibly. Ralph, you might answer that a little bit differently. So I'm going to give you yeah, a chance. Yeah, I just wanted to offer that this new technology, especially in drone use, is just increasing so much. It's being used for fire. It is being used for monitoring of invasive species, all kinds of things. So if the question is about the administrative use of drones, it is discouraged in wilderness, but there may, I want to leave that do door open, there may be a case where administratively the agency might make a decision to allow a drone under certain specified conditions. The other side of that, though, is everything Jack was just mentioning. It's prohibited in wilderness. There is the sound of the drone. There is the invasion of something coming overhead, 
What is that doing in the back country? Typically drones have a GoPro camera on them. You get into issues of privacy. So there's, this is coming. This is one of the many challenges that we're gonna be facing in the future. As far as their use in wilderness, we gotta be very careful about how and when we might use drones administratively. I would like to offer that I hope we can keep them out of wilderness. And there's other ways to do our monitoring without mechanized and motorized, but the issue is there, it's in front of us. And there was a clarifier. Um, the question was posed related to administrative use only. Um, and yeah, differentiating between backcountry and wilderness is important uh, for the Forest Service. Um, and sitting in my desk in the regional office, I know for Region 1, uh, we've had a handful of at least uh, discussions about the use for things like uh, monitoring dam safety, for example. We have dams in wilderness. Um, I, I know that we've used them for um, mapping fire lines um, in the region. And, um, and, and so it, there is a creep, creep of drone use going on already, I think, and something to um, think about. Okay, not seeing any more questions in the chat box. 